Right, do anyone know that anyone else is on their way, or shall we get started? You've not, have you had a lecture or anything before this, that people will be on their way from? So if they're not here now, they're late. Okay, so let's get started. So today is the last of these three introductory lectures. This is uh, regulation of uh, bacterial virulence. Again, for those of you who've done lots of genetics, you might find some parts of it uh, going a bit slow for you, but for those of you who haven't done genetics, maybe it will be going a bit fast. So we'll try and get a, um, a good compromise. So just to get, again orientate you, we're looking at regulation of bacterial virulence. Um, and this time I did actually get around to writing the learning objectives. Uh, so definition of terms, describe the kind of regulation, hierarchical nature of it. Uh, outline the kinds of transcription regulators and mechanisms and then in the latter part of the lecture we're going to look at how we can uh, analyze gene expression experimentally in the laboratory and what kind of methods are there available. So let's just again reinforce the point we made in the introductory lecture which is that when we're looking at the regulation of virulence we have this hierarchy here, multi-layered hierarchy uh, many different ways, different mechanisms in which gene expression and the production of proteins from those genes can be regulated. So we can get changes in DNA sequences. Uh, under certain circumstances, you can get some genes amplified, the, the gene numbers, particularly things on plasmids. There can be quite a lot of variation in plasmid copy number, and things on high copy number plasmids will be uh, expressed much more uh, than those on low copy number on the chromosome. You can get uh, genetic rearrangements, uh, so bits of DNA moving around, flip-flopping around uh, within the, the genome, or uh, you get these uh, slip stack, strand mispairing, where bits of the genome you know, so have, may have uh, 10 repeats in a row, and then it slips to 11 repeats and puts things out of frame. Flagella phase variation in Salmonella is well recognised as a example of phase variation where you have a piece of DNA that flips over so the promoter is pointing in the right direction to turn the gene on in one arrangement but it's pointing in completely the wrong direction the other way. We have transcriptional regulation, we're going to say more about transcription factors uh, later. Uh, at their simplest you have a transcription factor that re recognises a single uh, signal and then just regulates one gene or one operon. In fact, uh, that's fairly unusual, uh, and there are uh, there's a huge amount of crosstalk and, and um, inter, in, interdigitation between different regulatory networks. Translational regulation. I'm not sure. I've not come across any examples where translation is regulated in in the uh, regulation of virulence. So the, the the textbook example of this is tripoperon, where you have a little leader peptide that's made. And this regulates the, the, the tripoperon in, uh, in response to the amount of tryptophan that's available. But I'm not sure if there's any examples in, in, in regard to regulation of virulence. Um, I mean, there is one that we've come across in the type 3 secretion, um, but that's still very experimental. And then post-translational things. So we always go on about gene expression and, and turning genes on and making proteins, but we forget about the fact that actually how long the protein hangs around, how stable it is, whether there are mechanisms for destroying it, all those will also have an effect um, on uh, virulence and on the expression of that virulence phenotype. And again, just this is a, again the same slide as we showed before, just to make the point that we have to regulate gene expression. If we just leave genes on all the time, this is wasteful, it creates problems. 
So again, for those who've not done much genetics, just to remind you that in bacteria, most of these genes occur in operons. Uh, so having a single gene just on its own with a promoter is fairly unusual. And most of the time, we have these multiple genes encoded in what's known as a polycystronic mRNA. Um, so it's basically effective means polygenic mRNA. Um, and the uh, rationale for this in bacteria is that all those genes that have a common function can be subject to a common regulatory mechanism. And generally, when we look at operons, you can kind of see a rationale for why those genes are there together in an operon. There are a few um, uh, counterexamples there. Uh, Campylobacter jejuni uh, is, is an organism that I've worked on in the past. When the genome was first sequenced, it was clear that there were all sorts of genes in operons with other genes that didn't really make much sense, it wasn't quite so clear. In E. coli, generally, if you see an operon, you expect the things in it to make sense, to have a common function. Promoter of this DNA sequence that defines the binding site of the RNA polymerase and the various transcription factors. And these transcription factors can act as activators of transcription or repressors, depending on whether they facilitate transcription or whether they prevent the RNA polymerase from actually getting onto the promoter and doing stuff. Now, it's actually more complicated than that because if you've got a single operon, it might have more than one promoter. So it's not uncommon to have a, at least a couple of promoters. Um, and those operons can be controlled by different promoters under different conditions. Um, and sometimes you can have three, four, five different promoters uh, all in one, um, they're all, all looking at one uh, operon. So that's describing things verbally here is just again a, 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 a graphic to show you how this kind of works. So you have a trans uh, transcription factor binding side upstream of your um, uh, operon, and generally those are you can kind of recognize them by consensus. So there's not an absolute requirement for one particular find sequence that tends to be, uh, uh, you, you can come up with some kind of consensus sequence from most of these transcription factors, so you can sort of make a prediction that something will bind there, but uh, sometimes things don't bind where you expect them to, and sometimes they bind where you don't expect them to, uh, so it's not an absolute thing. Then you've got this, uh, the core promoter here, you've got this transcription start point, translation start point here in the coding region. And the key point here is that you've got several of these coding kind of regions strung together in, 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 in a row. And then you have a transcription terminator which stops transcription. And so you have this primary RNA transcript here and then various um, mRNAs produced from that and, and, uh, and then translated. So just a bit more about transcription factors. Uh, so these. Um, typically sit on the DNA here, with the DNA binding main sitting into the major groove. Typically, this uh, region that they're binding in the DNA will have inverted repeats. It's not absolute requirement, but it's a common thing that you'll find when you get transcription factors binding to these regions. Um, in addition to the uh, DNA binding domain, there's often a dimerization domain. There might also be some other domains that are responding to various signals. But it, it's simplest, this is the sort of thing you have, the DNA binding domain and a dimerization domain. You have a dimer forming uh, like that. Now, when we look at uh, gene expression in bacteria and in, in pathogens uh, in particular, we, we see these transcriptional regulatory networks, or TRNs. So at the simplest, these encompass the, the transcription factor and the target genes. And as I mentioned before, you can have, at its simplest, a single transcription factor, single gene, or single operon. Uh, they're fairly rare. And what we tend to see instead is this coordinate regulation of gene expression, where various things are coming on at the same time. So instead of having like, uh, you know, a set of light switches in your house, uh, what you also have is a fuse box where you can turn off the whole ring main for your downstairs and the whole ring main for upstairs. And, and so things are clustered together in ever higher levels of, uh, of regulation. Um, and we have this co-regulation co of multiple genes and operons 
and we mentioned these terms before, you know, common regulator, it's a common regulator they call Regulon, it's a common stimulus they call Stimulon. The point is though that these uh, networks overlap. It is, it gets to be very complex when you start trying to pick these things apart. So we, we like to be reductionists uh, as scientists. We like to sort of think, oh, we can understand that. We, we knock that gene out, we'll see an effect and we'll get something we understand. Sometimes these effects cascade through regulatory networks and you get up all sorts of things you can't really understand. It's not intuitive. And in fact, to, to really understand transcriptional regulation in the bacterium, you have to start building models uh, uh, and understanding that way. Much of it is not something that you can simply intuit. Um, and, and we have these uh, global regulators that sit right at the top of the hierarchy and then make about 50 of them in E. coli. Um, and if you knock those out, you see all sorts of effects on the cell. And actually working out, well, why is it having that effect? Is it it's regulating a regulator that regulates that, or is it regulating a regulator that regulates another regulator? Or, or, yeah. Is it that it's regulating an activator that then regulates a, a repressor, and so on? It's very, very difficult to, to, to tease apart. Just to keep things simple, let's start, there, we are, there are some simple systems. Um, we mentioned the Kiri before, one of my favourite organisms. Uh, you ha we have here this tox gene, the bacteria toxin gene, regulated by a repressor, DTXR. Um, and back in the 1980s, there was a lot of work done on defining this, showing that this DTXR indeed was an iron activated transcription factor, uh, that when you added iron bonds to it, uh, it became a repressor, sat there on the DNA, stopping transcription. When there was no iron around, in iron limiting conditions, uh, the thing dissociates um, and um, the, the uh, repressor comes off and the toxin gene is expressed. Seems quite simple. In fact, uh, it's not that simple as we move from sort of in, into the 21st century. Uh, with genomes and the whole genome approaches and so on, it became clear that actually there's a whole range of things regulated by DTXR. Although we focused in on it initially because it regulated the diphtheria toxin, here's a related Carinobacterium, uh, Carinobacterium butamicum, a close relative of Carinobacterium diphtheria, which produces diphtheria. And here, the homologous protein DTXR here is actually uh, regulating a global regulatory network involved in iron metabolism. And, and so there's all these different uh, operons and gene clusters here that are regulated by this single one regulator. So iron transport systems, secreted proteins, iron utilization storage, methylases, other regulatory proteins, so hypothetical proteins. So this just as one example gives you a flavor of how complex these things can be. In fact, uh, when uh, modelers uh, start looking at this stuff, they, they actually recognize that there are six basic called motifs that occur in these networks. Um, so you have a feed-forward loop, for example, where you have uh, a regulator regulating a regulator that has, an, uh, uh, that has an effect downstream. But that first regulator might also have its own positive effect on the network. So when you yeah, that creates a kind of robustness in the system. You may get auto-regulation where a regulator regulates itself. So you look to see, I would imagine, I don't know for certain, but DTXR, we'd be surprised if DTXR actually is involved in DTXR, the gene expression. Um, Multi-component loop, regulated chains, this kind of stuff. The thing is though, that once you start mixing all these together, you get this very complex uh, regulatory network, which you, you really can only understand through sophisticated models. It's just this uh, a kind of God's eye view of gene regulation in E. coli, um, looking at the regulators, regulating regulators and so forth. And, um, you can see right at the top there, there are things like CRP, which is regulating thousands, over a thousand genes in E. coli, uh, and so forth. So this is a sort of pattern. So, moving on to some specific examples of regulators. Again, those of you who've done genetics will have come across this, but those of you who haven't may not. Uh, we have a very common regulator 
uh, family of the helix turn helix transcriptional regulators. Um, they contain this heat turn helix motif, um, and there's a recognition helix which is binding to the DNA, there's a stabilizing helix, there's a turn. And these are common in all aspects of, sort of uh, bacteriology, bacterial physiology. But they also do occur, not surprisingly, in virulence regulation. So members of the ARA-C family of helix turn helix regulators uh, regulate in, in, in cholera, they regulate the toxin production, with uh, tox-T. In, in salmonella, we have things like HIL-D involved in the regulation of, of, type, of the type 3 secretion system. Um, there's another group, the LICE-R group, which are involved in something called quorum sensing, of which more uh, uh, later in the talk. It's also important to recognise that we don't just have this very simple relationship um, with a signal coming in uh, and regulating one uh, regulator, regulating one gene or one. We, with this signal uh, actually can be uh, uh, transduced through this uh, regulatory machinery, uh, through this complex uh, signal machinery. So a signal might come into a regulator which then regulates, which then signal is transduced to another thing that actually has a downstream effect on gene expression. Um, and there, there can, well, there are often what we call partner switching pathways where something interacts with something that we're in one state and then it switches partners and interacts with something else. Um, so in type 3 secretion, in, in flagella biosynthesis, we see things that are secreted start off being in the cytoplasm and they're binding to a regulator or to something that might have an influence on regulation, then they get secreted and you have a downstream effect then on gene expression. So the proteinic secretion state of the cell is coupled to gene expression. In that way. Very common uh, kind of signal transduction occurs in these so-called two-component regulatory systems. And these have a uh, sense of kinase, which can be in the cytoplasm or quite commonly can be in the inner membrane, and this detects some kind of environmental signal, and it phosphorylates itself, uh, but in response to the environmental signal, it then goes on and passes on that phosphate onto a response regulator, which is found in the cytoplasm of that here. Uh, and this is a DNA binding protein that regulates transcription, uh, and it changes its state. Once it gets phosphorylated, it then go on uh, uh, and have an effect on um, gene regulation, which it wouldn't have in its unphosphorylated state. These systems, you, when they were first described, uh, they were described as pairs, or tightly coupled pairs of, of sensor kinase regulating a given response regulator. And indeed, you do find them encoded in the genome in pairs, uh, in gene clusters together. But it's clear that uh, you can have uh, intervening elements, that, so the, the relay of phosphorylation can involve, say, three different proteins rather than just two. And there is the potential for crosstalk. So although we might say, oh, that regulator there, that sensor kinase generally phosphorylates its cognate regulator, it may be having some small activity also, maybe 90% of the time that its activity is regulating one sensor, uh, one uh, response regulator, but maybe 10% is regulating another. And again, this is one of those complex issues that, that really is amenable to modeling um, uh, to really get the head around it. And there are about 50 of these systems in E. coli, and there's been a, a lot of interest in actually defining what each one of them does and, and how much there is cross talk between them. This just shows you it's, uh, graphically how this kind of thing works. So you have a signal out there which interacts with the, the histidine sensor kinase. So the sensor kinase is phosphorylated on a histidine, um, and the response regulator uh, is phosphorylated on a spartate residue. Um, and you get this movement of the phosphate onto the response regulator in response to that signal. Um, and then you have an interaction with RNA polymerase which uh, will have an effect on gene regulation, gene expression. Some of these that regulate toxin gene expression, where there's a system BVGS, BVGA, in Bordetella pertussis, regulates pertussis toxin, and another toxin in that organism that regulates cyclase. Uh, Clostridium perfringens, alpha toxin, uh, which you 
sort of gruesome pictures of someone with gas gangrene in the murder at all. But that's regulated by this pair of uh, Vera S and Vera R. Uh, Staph aureus, AGRA, AGRC regulate numerous toxins, so a similar thing in strep pyogenes. Um, and there are others that uh, regulate other virulence factors. So on par OP is probably the most extensively studied uh, two component system implicated in virulence. It's implicated in virulence in a range of enteric organisms in E. coli and particularly in Salmonella, been studied extensively there. Another system, SSRA, SSRB, is found in Salmonella, regulating a pathogenicity ion in SPI2 in a particular regulating a secretion system, a type 3 secretion system encoded by that type, by that um, uh, pathogenicity island. And, and you'll hear more about that later in the course. Another interesting phenomenon that we see in terms of signal transduction and sensing and regulation in bacteria is quorum sensing. So this is a mechanism by which bacteria can assess their population density. So is there just one or two E. coli's around in this particular environment, or are there, is there a million of them all crowded together? Um, and this mechanism here means that there's a, it regulates responses in a way that ensures that there's enough cells around uh, that the, um, the, 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 the response you have will have the desired effect. There are some things that are not worth doing if you're just a single cell on your own. The other thing is also if you get crowded, you may uh, maybe a, a recognition that it's time to move to a different kind of lifestyle. Um, so how does this work? So basically, in, in simple, simplest terms, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible, you have a specific auto-inducer, uh, which is shown here in this diagram uh, in blue. Um, and this is being produced by a given gene, uh, kind of just ticking along in the background. Um, and that diffuses across the cell envelope, goes out into the external milieu. And if there are not many bacteria around, uh, not particularly high cell density, then they just diffuse away and nothing much happens. But if there are lots of cells, and there are lots of cells in close proximity, instead of diffusing away, it will actually uh, go into another cell um, and switch on a gene there, which in turn switches on production of the auto-inducer in that cell. Um, and so you get this positive feedback loop started. So that one cell is signaling, I'm making auto-inducer, and the next cell says, ah, oh, okay, so I better switch on auto-inducer, and you get this cascade where the whole population then flips over to producing lots and lots of the auto-inducer. But the other twist in the tail there is that in, in addition to that happening, the autoinducer also switches on the expression, or switches off in some cases, the expression of other genes uh, that are related to virulence. Um, so here, these things in red are things uh, that might be toxins or other things that are being switched on once you reach this critical uh, state. You've got a quorum of bacteria there sufficient to move to that level, that, that, that uh, state. Uh, there are now several different classes of autoinducer have been described. The acyl homocerin lactone was the first one to be identified, uh, in particular vibrios, um, um, but uh, there are now a range of them. And I'm not expecting you to memorise this, but these uh, screen dumps from a review, which I've put up on the Web CT, just give you a flavour of how. Uh, Common this kind of approach is in, in gene regulation within uh, virulence. Um, so here you have this AGR, uh, quorum sensing system in Staphylococcus aureus, um, turning on uh, the regulation of the expression of a whole range of virulence factors there, capsules, adhesins, toxins, proteases, and all sorts of things. And this is a very complex system where there's a particular RNA, which is not a non-coding RNA, uh, as part of that system. In Pseudomonas ruginosa, there is a, a very well characterized uh, quorum sensing system that uh, regulates lots of different things, elastases, production of, of motility, 
that is other things that are involved in virulence. Um, and this uh, is switched on when the cells are at very high density. For example, in the lungs of someone with cystic fibrosis, uh, Pseudomonas originosa can grow up to very large levels and, and then switch these things on. Uh, and in E. coli also, it's clear that there are these um, quorum sensing systems which are involved in regulation of virulence, type 3 secretion, for example. Um, and they are responsive not only to autoinducers, to this quorum sensing, but interestingly, E. coli can sense things like noradrenaline and adrenaline uh, in the environment and change its gene regulation in response to that. So if you get stressed out and you're producing lots of adrenaline, that may well be having an effect on gene expression on E. coli in your gut. Another, I mean, we're just whizzing through a lot of stuff very quickly and touching on things superficially, but I'm just providing you with a kind of map of the landscape. Some of these things we will cover in more detail in the case studies later in the course. But it's worth pointing out that RNAs can also, non-coding RNAs can also regulate uh, bacterial virulence. And this is a, I mentioned before, this is a growing area of research. The kind of recognising, you know, it's not as simple as DNA makes RNA makes protein and, and it's nice and linear and straightforward. These things, these non-coding uh, 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 RNAs can have various effects. Some of them can act as antisense RNAs. So that RNA itself is not being uh, not producing a protein, but it's interacting with an RNA that could produce a protein, and by interacting with it, it's modulating its expression, dampening down its expression when it's, it's bound together and so on. Okay, so that's that was just a quick whistle stop tour, just to give you some conceptual background to the regulation of gene expression in bacteria. Now let's just spend 10 or 15 minutes just talking about um, the experimental approaches that we might use when we want to study virulence gene expression in the laboratory. Again, just to provide you with a, a handle on reading papers about this um, and, and when we come to the individual organisms, giving you some back, more background. So if we want to find out about gene regulation, well, one lazy way, I think that people do in my group, we just go and look at a genome. And we look at the sequences in the genome, and we try and make predictions from the sequences about how things are regulated. So you can identify transcription factors fairly easily, two component systems, all those kind of things, fairly easily, just by homology, because they, they clearly are related to each other in terms of their protein sequence. You can look for promoter consensus sequences uh, in, the, in the genome, so you can see where the RNA polymerase is likely to bind. And you can identify binding sites for various regulatory factors. Some of them are um, have very well defined, easy to recognize binding sites. Others, it's a bit harder. Maybe the consensus is not quite so clear cut. Um, one thing that people often do is they try and represent the binding site by these so called sequence logos. So what they're saying here is at position six, it's very, very, very likely, almost overwhelmingly likely to have a T there. But position seven, there's a good chance you have a G, but in some cases you do get a T or an A. And it's just a, a, a way of visualizing what those consensus uh, sequences look like. The other thing you can uh, relatively easily do uh, is identify operons, uh, well, but just se through sequence gating. If you have a string of genes all in a, in a row, all pointing in the same direction, and there really isn't much space between them, often genes, adjacent genes and operon, sometimes the coding sequences even overlap by a base pair or two, but even if they don't, you don't usually see more than a few bases between them. So when you see a string like that, you say, oh yeah, that's an operon, that's, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, and if you look at the homology, predictions of the genes in that operon, you'll often see that they have common uh, functions. Another, if you want to start doing experimental things, there are ways in which you can uh, identify what transcript, potential transcription factors are binding to what DNA sequences uh, in various ways. So these are called gel retardation assays um, or electromobility um, retardation. Is it? Anyway, there's, a, there's another formal term for them, which I've forgotten at the moment. But anyway, in this, what you do is you run DNA out in a gel. So in this way here, you cut your DNA, say, with a restriction enzyme, you run a bit out there. And then 
In this lane here, what you've done is, as well as loading the DNA, you've added the protein to that DNA before you run it out on the gel. And what happens is a particular fragment of DNA, because it's now bound to the protein, it's moving through the gel more slowly. And it gets, so it's, its movement is retarded. And in that way, you can actually then say, oh, right, so that's where the, the, the DNA, uh, that's where the, the protein is binding for that particular piece of DNA. You could then cut that out of the gel, if you like, and sequence it. Another approach, more sophisticated approach for sort of working out where uh, regulators bind is so-called footprints in assay. You mix the DNA with protein. Um, so you've got your labelled DNA there and you um, mix the DNA. Then you digest that. Uh, you do a, a nuclease digest with DNA is one, limited digest. So you don't want to just chew up all the DNA. You just let the nuclease go free for a short while, so it starts nibbling away at the DNA, but doesn't complete uh, the destruction of the DNA. And what you find there is that there is a part of the DNA uh, that is protected from that nuclease. And so you can identify which regions of the DNA have been protected from digestion. You can run it out, you run it out on a gel. So this is like a, an old-fashioned sequencing gel where you have these lanes, ACs, Ts and Gs. And there will be a part here where you can see when you've run out these uh, labelled products that there's a gap there uh, in, in the gel representing the footprint of the uh, regulator. So that part of the DNA has been protected. That's where the regulator is sitting. Um, another um, more sophisticated, in fact, a global approach to working out which regulators are sitting where uh, is chromatin immunoprecipitation. Now this is, it is only fairly recently been applied to bacteria. In fact, Steve Busby here in Birmingham has been one of the pioneers of using this approach with bacteria. It's commonly used uh, in eukaryotic systems. In fact, this uh, figure that I uh, borrowed from Wikimedia is actually uh, looking at its application to eukaryotic cells, but the principles are the same when you apply it to bacteria. Um, so you, you basically what you do is you cross-link the DNA to protein. So you, you extract out uh, it lies the cells, you get in your uh, DNA, but you're cross, you cross-link it with, with formaldehyde to the protein. And then you shear up the DNA, um, typically by sonicating it, and you end up with a load of fragments. And some of those fragments have got protein stuck on them, some of them have got no protein stuck on them at all. And then you pull down the protein that you're interested in. So if you're interested in a particular transcription factor, you may use an antibody to that transcription factor to actually pull, down, pull that down out of the mixture. So that will then enrich for, for these um, ones where you've got the transcription factor bound to the DNA. And then the smart thing is you can actually undo the crosslink, reverse the crosslinking, and then loop the DNA uh, off of that uh, transcription factor and then sequence that five years ago, we would have hybridized that to a microarray. Nowadays, um, you know, the interesting thing to do is what we call chip seek, where you do um, high throughput sequencing of all those fragments that are coming off there. So, this means that you can then say, you could take that DTXR, let's say, in Kymanobacterium glutamicum, uh, you could to pull, pull, uh, do all this to the to Kymanobacterium glutamicum genome pull down DTXR, and then work out exactly where in that genome DTXR is binding. Um, and this will give you a clear handle. And um, the, one of the reasons for doing this is if you think about, say, that DTXR paper, what they would have done there was knocked out. Let's say they knock out DTXR, uh, and they say, oh, if we knock out DTXR, we see all these genes changing gene expression. But you don't know whether that's a direct effect of DTXR actually binding to that particular operon or whether actually DTXR is regulating another regulator. And that's what's binding there. So if you combine these different approaches, the chromatin representation will show you what's directly binding to a piece of DNA. You can work out those direct, separate out those direct from indirect effects. Okay, so if we want to measure gene expression in pathogens, we, we have a number of things we have to think about, first of all. So typically what we do is we, we're not measuring it as an absolute thing. We're trying to compare 
what goes on when the pathogen is in the host causing an infection and, or, or under particular stress compared to what we call basal conditions, basically living in paradise when the organism is in, in rich laboratory media growing under optimal conditions. Um, so you know, comparing what happens on a broth on a plate compared to what's going on inside cells or this is a whole animal. Um, and we have, there's, a num there's no perfect way of doing this, there's a number of trade-offs that you have to make. You can either do a direct assay or you can assay a reporter, which you, uh, and I'll say more about that in a minute. You also may be interested, are you interested in one gene? I just want to know what happens to that particular, I want to know what happens to diphtheria toxin gene when I stick this organism into a, into a guinea pig. Or are you interested in, actually I want to know what, what happens to all the genes in, in that organism. In, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people would do kind of opportunistic searches. They would, you'd get a paper. If you could say, I got, found one iron-regulated gene in Corynobacterium diphtheriae that isn't the toxin, you'd get a paper out of that. Nowadays, people would say, well, we want you to actually tell us about every iron-regulated gene in Corynobacterium diphtheriae um, and have a global survey. So there's been a, a kind of switch over time. So, reporter gene fusions, what do we do there? Well, we, we basically we have a test gene. Let's say we want diphtheria toxin gene. We want to see what's happening there. Measuring the diphtheria toxin uh, production is, is, is difficult. Um, it's not standardized and you know, all that. But what we do is we actually make a fusion between the, the beginning of the um, report, uh, beginning of the test gene, the diphtheria toxin gene, and some kind of reporter, like beta-galactosidase, for example, which um, produces an enzyme where we, we know what the substrates are, we can actually make a very um, stable, systematized uh, kind of approach to, to measuring it, uh, reproducible, optimized, I'd say. Um, and and the, the other thing we can do with this kind of approach is we can uh, have what we call promoter traps. So instead of saying, I want to look at what uh, happens to diphtheria toxin gene expression in, 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 the, in the host, you can say, I want to just look at all the iron-regulated genes in diphtheria. I want to trap the promoters that will be turned on by iron. So how do we do this? So with LACZ, we have a promoter for the test gene there. You have the ribosome binding site that starts, so you have this uh, promoterless LACZ. So the only way that LACZ, the, the, the protein actually gets made, the beta gets made, is if there's a promoter there to drive transcription and then to get the translation later. And this is a very uh, common um, fusion that's used uh, to measure gene expression in E. coli. Um, and there's a very simple uh, colour change. If you use the right reagents, you get this substrate given a colour change, and you see some colonies will be uh, bluish and others will not be background to here with some of these blue colonies on there. So this is a very easy way of measuring uh, gene expression. Um, so one way, if we wanted to look at what genes are turned on by iron in a particular organism, we could make uh, a library, get this transpose on, to jump into various parts of the genome. And if it jumped into a part of the genome where there was a, an iron uh, responsive promoter, what you'd see is you'd see um, a gene which would be switched on under, say, low iron conditions. So this colony here would give us a lactose signal uh, when there's low iron, but not when there's high iron. So we'd use a, a technique called replica plating, where we take the same colonies on that, on these two different plates, they'd be exactly the same positions in the two different plates, and you can compare them and say, oh, look, there's a colony which uh, the, the gene is switched on only under low iron conditions. Obviously, there will be some genes that are switched on under both conditions, they're on all the time, and there will be some genes that just don't seem to work, with some fragments that don't have any promoters that don't come on at all. But in this way, we can actually start to pick promoters that are interesting. Now, there is a, a technique that allows you to kind of uh, look for promoters that are actually active in a whole animal, in the host. Uh, this is known as e in vivo expression technology, or IVET, invented by a very clever guy at Harvard uh, called uh, John Mechalanos. 
And, and what this, uh, how this approach works is you, you make a kind of promoter library, fusion library, where a bit of random data gets shoved into one particular position here. Uh, and next to that, you've got some kind of gene which is essential for survival in the host for that particular bacterium. Um, and then you have downstream of that in frame, you have lac the LACZ coding sequence. Details of which genes you use as a centre and host, you perhaps don't need to know, but if you're interested, you can, there are various approaches. You can use um, amino acid, the genes involved in scavenging amino acids, or producing amino acids, sorry, sorry producing amino acids. So it, 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 there are some amino acids, aromatic amino acids, which are actually fairly um, limiting in host tissues. Uh, and if so, the bacterium preferentially likes to make its own aromatic amino acids, but if you knock out that capability, um, it, it really can't survive uh, very well uh, in the lab. So that, that was one example. I think, and purines as well is another thing that's been locked out. There is a, um, a technique, a variation of this, where you actually feed the um, animal antibiotics and, the, uh, and it produces antibiotic resistance gene fused to the LACZ, and that's required. So there are various methods of but basically what you do there is you, you, you make a pool, like we did with the STM yesterday, of these, and you stick that into um, a mouse, and then you plate it out afterwards, and you plate it out onto um, a medium that allows you to score the LACZ phenotype. And what you want is you want things that are actually where the LACZ is not expressed here on the lab. So the fact that these cells have survived coming through the mouse means that that promoter must have been on in vivo because it's, it's, it, they have to have expressed that essential uh, protein that it's fused in that cell. But you don't want all the genes that are on all the time. You want the ones that are on in the host but not on in the lab. And that's why if you pick the, uh, the white columns here, you will end up with things which, where, the gene, where that promoter has been active in the host but not active under laboratory conditions. And so this um, approach has been used, has given us quite an insight into what genes are actually switched on preferentially during the infection. There are various ways you can measure individual gene expression. The simplest way of doing this is you can just do uh, um, reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction uh, on a given set of genes. So if you imagine this is a sim very simple operon here, You've got a promoter, you've got a terminator, you've got this transcript, you've got these three genes, uh, two coding sequences in there. Um, and if you did PCR across between these two, between these two, between these two, and between these two, you'll get different results uh, if you do it with a reverse transcript case and if you just do it with a, a normal PCR. So with the normal PCR, each of those will work. The primers, it's testing your primers are okay, everything's okay. But if you're looking at mRNA through your, when you actually get rid of the DNA and then you just look at RNA and reverse transcribe it, only these two will give you products because these two are actually part of the transcript, whereas the other one and four are not part of that transcript. So this is a very easy way of just saying, oh, is there a transcript there? Where is it going? Which genes are in an operon? Which ones are not? Uh, and so on. More interesting nowadays is really to measure global gene expression. We're nearly finished, aren't we? A couple of minutes. Um, and we can do this in various ways. Uh, microarrays, uh, 15 years ago, they were all the rage. Um, nowadays, uh, the exciting uh, money is on a technique known as RNA-seq. Um, and basically, again, you come back to what we say, you can look at, uh, it's a comparative thing where you actually look at uh, basal conditions and then look at some interesting other conditions, so acid stress or heat shock in the lab. If you really want to be smart, you can actually try and extract RNA from cells, from bacterial cells growing inside eukaryotic cells, growing inside eukaryotic tissues uh, that are being in, uh, in the whole animal. So again, I'm not sure how much genetics you've done. Have you all heard of microarrays? This is basically how it works, you know, control and test cells. You harvest two lots of RNA, two lots of cDNA, one, you tag them with different tags, and you end up with different patterns. 
So this provides us with a genome-wide survey of thousands of genes all in one go. So it's basically global. Um, just to, to say, though, up, coming right up to date, um, there's a lot of interest, instead of using microarrays, in, in actually, instead of um, hybridizing those two populations of cDNA that you've got to a microarray, we now just sequence them. Uh, because it's so high throughput sequencing means we can very, very rapidly sequence thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of sequences uh, within a few days. Um, and, and there are lots of advantages of just going in and sequencing that cDNA rather than hybridizing it to an array. Uh, I've listed some of them there. But basically it, 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 there's a lot of bias that comes in when you're making a microarray because you have to sort of choose what are the probes that you're going to put on your array. Uh, and you might, you know, when we started off doing microarrays, we'd say, oh, well, we'll go and represent every predicted coding sequence in the genome. So in E. coli, we'd say, oh, there's 4,500 genes, and we'd make a little spot for each one of those genes. But, of course, we are making that assumption based on our bioinformatic analysis of the genome as to where those genes are, which genes are real genes and which ones are not. There's an assumption there. And so things like these RNAs, regulatory RNAs, that don't make proteins are not protein coding genes, they, we were just blind to those, whereas now all of that starts coming out as we use these new, this new whole transcriptome shotgun sequencing RNA-seq approach. The major problem with this approach, there are two problems really, one is uh, it, it is still more, much more expensive than microarrays. Sequencing is getting cheaper, it's getting easier, I think that difference will change over the next uh, few years. At the moment, if you do this kind of stuff, you're going to get high-impact papers because it's pioneering, but I think it will slowly start to replace microarrays. The other problem is it does require a different sort of skill set in terms of analysis of the data. Um, how does it work? Well, we start off with uh, the starting material, bacterial RNA, that we um, harvest from the bacteria. The problem is if you, if you harvest RNA, most of the RNA that you get out of the bacterium will be um, ribosomal RNA uh, and some tRNAs. And so there's uh, this interesting question at the moment of, well, what's the point in sequencing all that RNA and 90% or 95% of it coming back as ribosomal RNA? We're just sequencing loads of stuff that's not of interest to us. So some people advocate that you should remove that stuff. Other people would say that you don't need to remove that stuff because high throughput sequence is so efficient that you still get the same kind of result anyway. Because you know, just okay, 90% is rubbish, but it's so cheap to do it doesn't matter. Uh, you then uh, get on and um, uh, make cDNA from that in various ways, and then there are various platforms where you can do high throughput sequencing, and then you map the sequences you get to the genome, so you can see lots and lots of sequence in this region here that are corresponding to this particular gene here that's being expressed, that's being expressed, that's being expressed, and so forth. And then between those regions you'll see there is no sequence because that's an intergenic region. Um, okay, I've just about finished and I'm running out of power. So I've taken you through all these issues. Happy <coughs> to take any questions. Otherwise, I'll see you next week when we'll be talking about genome analysis for bacteria. <coughs>